My name is Benedict Ashley. I am a professor of moral theology at Aquinas Institute of Theology in St. Louis. If you don't recognize my religious habit, I'm a member of the Order of Preachers, ordinarily called the Dominican Fathers. And this course of lectures is dealing with a problem that of, is of considerable importance in the church right now, and that is how do we base our moral teaching and thinking and living on the Holy Scriptures? It's a problem because the Bible is the root of our faith. In it, we have the Word of God. And nevertheless, the Bible was written 2,000 years ago. And so a lot of people reading the Bible say, well, it's irrelevant to our times, except perhaps that it states a few general motivations for doing good. But it really doesn't give us guidance. And so what I'm trying to show in this uh, series of lectures is that, in fact, the scriptures remain for the church and for us in our daily living and in the practical details of our life today a real God. But we have to understand how the church interprets the scriptures. I explained those problems in the first lecture, and in the second lecture, I treated of the Old Testament. How in the Old Testament, the very heart of the, of the Old Testament is the covenant with God, which is found in the first five books of the Bible. The Torah, or law, or better, the instruction. The instruction on how to live. That's the heart of the Old Testament. But there are other books that help us to understand that law. There are wisdom literature, which expresses the daily experience, the down-to-earth experience of the wise men, the elders of the Jews. There is poetry, which hel helps us to have the right kind of feelings and attitudes. There are stories that make a moral point about our life and give us example. Histories that also give us examples. And finally, there is prophecy. And it was on that that we ended the last lecture. That prophecy in the, in the Old Testament, on the one hand, helps us to see the, the right attitude, the right purpose in keeping the law of God. That what God wants is not just external behavior, but a change of heart, a conversion of the heart. But there's another aspect of prophecy, and that is that it looks forward to the future. It's a message of hope. The world we actually see around us and our own personal lives are not everything that we think and know they ought to be. And so we have to hope for a future time when things are going to improve. And for the Jews, the prophets told them of the messianic age, when, the, when there would be a king who would rule in peace and justice, and when the hearts of the people would be converted. Now in this lecture, we come to the New Testament and try to see the relation of the New, teaching, uh, the New Testament teaching on morality to the Old Testament. We can make the mistake of thinking that the New Testament replaces the Old Testament. And so we could take our Bibles and tear out the Old Testament, which is the bigger part of the Bible, get rid of it because it's obsolete. And some people who don't think that do make a great contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament. One of the features of the Protestant Reformation was to contrast, contrast law on the one hand and gospel on the other. And to interpret the Bible as if 
the Old Testament was given by God to teach us that we cannot be good of ourself, and the New Testament had as its purpose to tell us that God is going to forgive us anyway, and Jesus Christ will take our place and satisfy God's demands for justice. Well, that really does not say it the way the Catholic Church has always understood the relation between the two Testaments. It's true there is a great difference between the Old and New Testament. It's true that the New Testament, as Jesus himself said, is new wine in new bottles. And you can't put new wine in old bottles or the bottles will break. There is something really new about the New Testament. But it's also true that the Old Testament remains of value. And why is it? Well, if you look at the, the New Testament, you will see that Jesus doesn't spend a lot of time on giving very detailed guidance to our life. He talks about a few rather general principles. And except on some special occasions, he doesn't really come down to many concrete details. Now, there are two ways to look at that. And I think there have always been in the church two attitudes which reflect two different, you might say, personal temperaments. There are some people who want in their life detailed guidance. They realize that they're, they're not very prudent themselves. They can make a lot of mistakes. <clears throat> and they, consequently, they would like to be guided. They would like a detailed set of prescriptions on how to act. Now, that's not bad. It often shows a lot of wisdom to know our limitations, to know that we need guidance and counsel is a very important thing. <clears throat> we see today how often after a, in a crisis or a disaster, we call in psychological counselors because people under pressure need help. Well, that's true of us all. We all need guidance, and we need a lot of guidance in our life. And so that attitude of obedience Obedience to guidance is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. On the other hand, there's a different kind of temperament in the church, which also has its place. Those are the people who say, well, God gave me an intelligence. God gave me free will. He wants me to grow up. He wants me to use my own judgment. He wants me to be creative in the way I solve problems. He wants me to meet new problems with new answers. That's not a bad attitude either. Certainly God, in making us in his image and giving us the world, gave us the world to be his stewards, to be rulers over his creation, to use our imagination, our creativity, our intelligence, and to grow up and not constantly ask somebody else to tell us what to do. Both attitudes are natural. They're both needed in the church. We find some people who carry out the laws, the rules, other people who are, take certain risks. However, there's a danger in both attitudes. The danger of the first attitude is that of a kind of scrupulosity, a worrying over details, and a forgetting the important things. In the New Testament, we see Jesus criticize the Pharisees, and sometimes he criticized them pretty harshly because they are scrupulous. They worry, he says, about a gnat they, and swallow a camel. They worry about small things 
and they don't look to the big things of the law. That's the danger of the attitude which reduces morality simply to obedience. On the other hand, there's a great risk in those people who have too much sense of their own independence. They cast aside the experience of the past. They're stubborn and they won't look for guidance when they need it. And Jesus rebukes that also in the people of his time. He condemns his own, uh, the city in which he lived, the city of Capernaum, because they listened to him and they wouldn't pay any attention. They wouldn't hear what he had to say. They were too proud of their own views. And so we have to find a middle way between those two extremes so that we don't make either of those mistakes. And it seems to me that's one of the important points of the New Testament. The reason that Jesus does not dwell on details is not because we don't need detailed guidance or because he is throwing over the old laws. For example, Jesus does not speak specifically about many sexual sins. Does that mean then that he abolished the commandments against the, them and they're no longer sins because he says nothing about them? Not at all. He presupposes that we have already read the Old Testament. We have studied it. We have taken it to heart as he had, as he quotes it constantly, and as the religious Jews around him constantly referred to the Old Testament for detailed guidance of their life. That remains valuable to us, necessary to us. On the other hand, Jesus no longer wants us to be tied down by every particularity that was necessary for the Jews. St. Paul says that the old law was our pedagogue until we had grown up. Jesus wants to give us a certain freedom. And so he took away the detailed prescriptions of the old law and left those fundamental prescriptions of morality which cannot be changed and are always true. So there is a Christian liberty. The epistle of St. James calls the gospel, the law of liberty, the law of liberty. It's a law, and, but it also leaves a certain freedom for our own intelligence, our own reasoning, our own creativity. And we have to find a mean between those two things. The church itself, and the teaching authority of the, in the church of the Holy Father and the bishops always make that point. They always try to point out the things that are essential, that must be observed because they are unchanging principles of life. And on the other hand, a certain freedom of judgment, of difference of opinion, of adjustment to personal circumstances. We mustn't leave either out of our moral thinking. What was it then that Jesus did to the teaching of the Old Testament? Well, I think we can say he did two things. The first thing he did was the one I have just mentioned. He freed the Old Testament of those things, mainly dealing with the ceremonies of the old law, question about food to eat, the washing of hands, and so on the offering of this sacrifices in the temple, those were seen not to be the essential things of the law. That's one thing he did. But the other thing he did was to give us the right interpretation of the law so that we would see what is really essential, what the meaning of the law is. If we are to use our own judgment, if we are going to use our own creativity, 
it still has to be in cooperation with Almighty God. And that means we have to work with God. We have to understand God's plan of the world. And our decisions must be, however creative they are, must be in keeping with God's purposes. We have to cooperate with God. And so in the New Testament, instead of dwelling on details, which are presupposed from the Old Testament, Jesus puts his concentration in his sermons on pointing out how to interpret the law, how to understand the law of God. A very important example of that, and I think it is sort of the crucial passage in the, in the New Testament, <coughs> which helps us to see Jesus' attitude to the law, is the one that deals with a very important issue, the, important of, the importance of the indissolubility of marriage, of divorce. And it goes like this. Some Pharisees, this is in the 19th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Some Pharisees approached Jesus and tested him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause whatsoever? Now what they had in mind was the fact that among the rabbis, whose business it was to interpret the law, there was a disagreement. They read in Deuteronomy the, the law that said, If a man divorces his wife, he must give her a written document of divorcement. But they argued about what, for what reasons he could divorce his wife. Did it require something very grave like adultery? Or could it be something rather light? There was one rabbi who said that if a man's wife burnt his dinner, that was sufficient for a divorce. We have the same kind of thinking today, I think. But in any case, they disagreed on what the law meant. And so they come to Jesus, as if he were a rabbi, to interpret the law. Jesus replied, Have you not read? So he refers to the scriptures. But he doesn't refer just to the one text. He asks them to look at the scriptures as a whole, to interpret the scriptures by the, by the scriptures as a whole. And he says, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, no human being must separate. Then they said to him, then why did Moses command that this man give the woman a bill of divorce and dismiss her? Very reasonable question. Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife unless the marriage is unlawful and marries another, commits adultery. And so, notice how our Lord solves this problem. He says, don't just read one proof text, one text of the Scripture. You have to understand the Scripture as a whole. Secondly, the old law is imperfect. Moses realized that. And he doesn't say in the old law, it's all right to get divorced. He says, if you get divorced, then at least you must give your wife a document so that she would not be under legal difficulties. So Jesus says the old law is imperfect. So where do we go then for direction if the old law is imperfect? We go back to the beginning the law that God gave mankind in the beginning to Adam and Eve, the law of nature, the law of God. 
That is what we must refer to. And now that the New Testament has come, that the Messianic age is beginning, we can no longer live by an imperfect law. We must live by the law of God in its full perfection. And that is what I am teaching you. And so what Jesus is saying then is that his interpretation does not abolish the old law. It brings it to fulfillment. And he says in another passage that I quoted in an, an earlier lecture, don't think that I'm going to abolish the law. I'm not going to take away the least letter of the law till all is fulfilled. And it is fulfilled in the new law, the law of the New Testament. And that's what we have to look to. That is what the church interprets. The interpretation of the scriptures by the church, by the Holy Father, by the councils of the bishops with the Holy Father, by the bishop in his local diocese, that interpretation is the one that we must follow because it is guided by the Holy Spirit and is the fulfillment of the old law. It preserves everything that is essential in the first part of the Bible. And we must refer to the first part of the Bible to learn that. But it shows us what is essential and what is not, and what the meaning of the law is. Now, that did not solve the problem, though, for the early church. There were still problems left. And I think that goes to show us that Jesus does give us the opportunity to use our own intelligence, not apart from the Holy Spirit, because he promised to his church the Holy Spirit to help us. But he does expect us to use our intelligence, to use our experience, to understand him better, to cooperate with him better. Jesus preached in general only to the Jews. There are a few cases in which he speaks to pagans. He heals the servant of the centurion who was a Roman. He speaks to the, that woman of faith who was a Canaanite, a Syrophoenician, who was a pagan, but was nevertheless a woman in whom faith was being born. He speaks to the Samaritan woman who was a heretic, but who was coming to the faith. But those are rare instances. For the most part, Jesus, as he said to the Canaanite woman, had been sent by his father to preach to the Jews, to the chosen people, in order then that they might become witnesses of God to the whole world. And so there arose in the early church a problem for which there was no specific answer by Jesus himself. Jesus had not said in any detail how to answer this problem. The problem was what to do with the Gentiles, the pagans, who accepted the gospel. The apostles and the early converts to the gospel were all Jews. And they continued to live as Jews, to practice the old law. Jesus had never told them, give up the old law. They continued to practice it. Then what were they to do with Gentiles who were coming into the church? Were they to require of them that the, that the men be circumcised? That the women have a bath of purification? And that these people observe the dietary laws of the Jews, forbidding them to eat pork and other, uh, other un, un, unclean kinds of food. This would have been very difficult for the pagan who had never been raised that way, who did not understand the meaning of these customs. So what was to be done? That problem was left to the early church, to the apostles. And the person who found the answer was not one of the 12 apostles, but St. Paul, 
who had been converted after the death of Jesus. St. Paul, who had a mission especially to the pagans, quickly found out as a missionary that a great obstacle to conversion was this idea that, that the pagans would have to observe the ceremonial precepts of the old law. And guided by the Holy Ghost, because he was an apostle and had the authority to do so, he decided that it was not necessary for the pagan converts to observe the Jewish law. They did have to observe the moral law. And we find everywhere in St. Paul's writings that he repeats again and again the moral requirements of the old law. He doesn't let up on them the least bit. They're still there, but he does say you're not bound to the, moral to the ceremonial requirements. Some of the apostles were not so sure about that. They were Jews, had been raised Jews, and it seemed to them very odd. They didn't like it. And so we have in the book of Acts the account of what is called the Council of Jerusalem, where the apostles and other church leaders met together to discuss this very difficult question, which Jesus had not, in explicit words, clarified for them. Now, it doesn't mean that he said, said nothing about it. There were things in his teaching that helped them to make the decision, but they had to make the decision, and they did. And they said in their decision, it seems to us and to the Holy Spirit. What a daring expression that is. It seems to us and the Holy Spirit that this is the right thing. They had the authority from Christ himself, the authority as the bishops of the church, the leaders of the church invested with the authority of teaching to make this decision, to make it for all times. And they did. And in the last books of the Old Testament, we see that this, and particularly in the epistles of St. Paul, that this is implemented, implemented by Paul in his missionary work and in the new churches in, in Europe, which he was founding. That has given the church its pattern of how to use the scriptures. The church has continued to use the Old Testament. Against every, there was early in the church a, ma a man named Marcion, and there were the Gnostics who thought that the Old Testament, the Gnostics, that the, the Old Testament is the work of the devil. It's a God of law and anger and hatred. And they wanted to abandon the Old Testament. The church never did that. It kept the Old Testament. But it interpreted according to the mind of Jesus and according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit through those authorities set up in the church to guide the church. And that is the way that we use the New Testament as Catholics. We base our whole life on the scriptures. They are the word of God. We respect the Old Testament. We understand the Old Testament, however, according to the mind of Christ. And furthermore, we apply it to our times and our situations and in answer to misinterpretations and controversies through the authority of the Holy Father and the bishops. They have the right to tell us what the scripture means. They make no moral laws themselves. The Pope has no power to introduce a new commandment into the church. What he has the right and the authority to do is to interpret the commandments of God in a way that we can understand them and apply them to our situation, and to clear up difficulties and controversies 
that inevitably ar arise in our times. But he is obedient to the scriptures. He does not go against them. He obeys them. And we must all obey them because they are indeed the word of God. I've just made the point that St. Paul made a tremendous decision for the church along with the other apostles that the law of Christ does not require the practice of all the ceremonial details of the old law, but that it does require the Ten Commandments and everything that they imply for all time, for us. Now, if you have any doubt that when St. Paul talks about the freedom of the Christian, the liberty of the Christian, that he does not mean by that that therefore we simply follow our own conscience, as people say today. If by following your own conscience, it means that you don't pay any attention to the guidance which God gives you through the scriptures and through the church, if that's your understanding of freedom of conscience, then that it is certainly not what the Bible teaches or what St. Paul thought. Listen to St. Paul for a moment. He says to the early Christians, I say then, live by the Spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh has desires against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you may not do what you want. But if you are guided by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also follow the Spirit. So you see, St. Paul is saying, if you think of the law as just ex ex external regulations that are forced on you and that you have to obey because you're afraid of punishment, then that's not enough. Even for the Old Testament, it wasn't enough. And it is certainly not enough for us who are under the law of Christ. We have to live by the guidance of the Spirit, the Spirit who is in our heart and who tells us we must keep the law and more. We must not only keep all of the commandments of God, but we must do it in a spirit of love, of peace, of gentleness, and of justice. Well, that seems very hard, doesn't it? How is that possible? You know, we read in the life of Martin Luther that this was the crisis that so troubled him. It wasn't that he did not live the commandments. He was a monk. He tried to live the commandments. And probably he did pretty strictly. But, he felt in his heart rebellion against God. Rebellion against God's law. Now his answer, I think, was a mistaken one. 
because he concluded from that that he could not obey the law and therefore Christ had to obey the law for him. That is not really the teaching of the scriptures. Is not the way that the church has always understood the scriptures. The church understands this problem, and it is certainly a great problem, that when we look at the law, the moral law, simply as something we have to obey that prevents us from doing what we want, what we think is right, what we desire. When we look at the law that way, then we do rebel. And God becomes a rather hateful figure because he is the one who is keeping us from doing what we want and what we probably think is good to do. In our opinion, it's the right thing to do. We can't see why it's wrong. And we do then rebel against the law. But that is because we do not understand the law of Christ. That is, the law as Christ understood it. Christ saw in the law not something external, not an imposition of a tyrannical and authoritative God. He saw in it the guidance of a loving Father. He saw in it God's wisdom leading us to those things that will bring us true happiness and join us in a true community of peace and justice. So we have to understand morality the right way. We mustn't understand it as a child does. St. Paul says that his early converts were like children, that he had to feed on milk. But when they grew up, they had to understand things like mature men and women. And we must understand the morality which the Catholic Church teaches which is in the scriptures, which is the word of God, not as some external imposition on us, but as something that is the loving guidance of a loving father, the wise guidance of a loving father. When you read in the newspaper that the Holy Father has just issued a new encyclical or some new document, you notice that they usually say, Pope condemns, Pope denounces. And you get the impression, and I think it's because the people of our times have this rather childish view of morality, that moral law is something which is imposed by an authority that the church decides that this is wrong and you have to obey it because you're under authority and you may be punished if you don't. That's not a sensible human attitude and it isn't a Christian attitude. The Christian attitude is, I want whatever good information and good guidance to live my life that I can get. I turn to a doctor for advice about my health. I turn to a lawyer for advice about my rights. I turn to a businessman about my investments. We look for good information when we're serious about making a good decision. And so it has to be about our life decisions. They have to be based on the best information possible. What better information could we have than the wisdom of God? He didn't make his rules and regulations in order to show his authority. He did it because he knows better than we do. He knows us through and through. He made us. He understands us. 
He knows our desires, our needs, our troubles. And he wants to guide us along a path that leads to happiness. And the church wants to do the same thing. The church has no authority other than the authority given it by God. And that authority is not to make some kind of new uh, moral law, but to help us to understand the moral laws that already exist. And so there's no contradiction in St. Paul saying that Jesus has in one sense freed us from the law and another that he has made us servants of Christ and of God. Servants of Christ's law. Even he even used the expression slaves of the law of Christ to bring out the fact that the more we follow in Christ's footsteps, more closely we follow him, the more likely we are to arrive at eternal life. But there's something more than that. It's not only that the new law, the law of Christ, is a law which is not imposed from on outside, but something we see as guidance and that we want to follow because we see it as helpful. But it's also because the new law is the law of the Spirit. As St. Paul said in that passage, we live by the Spirit. And what we cannot do of ourself, the Spirit enables us to do through grace. It's true that only Christ and His Blessed Mother have perfectly fulfilled the law of God. Even the apostles had faults. Nevertheless, we can grow in the way that we keep God's law. We can grow in understanding it, and we can grow in fulfilling it, and we can grow in Christian character, in holiness, which enables us to fill that law consistently. This, I think, is the point that the Catholic Church has always insisted on, and which sometimes has been misunderstood by our Protestant brethren. The church does not believe that we can do anything good of our own. That would be contrary to Scripture. The Gospel of St. John tells us without Christ we can do nothing which is good, nothing which can lead to our salvation. We can do something perhaps that is humanly good. We can give something to charity, for example, we can pay our debts. But that will not lead us to everlasting life unless we do that for the right motive, unless we are moving toward God. If we do it for human motives, it can leave even, even lead us astray. The person who gives alms may do it out of pride, and his pride will lead him into worse things, into bad things. To do anything that is good, we need the grace of Christ. Anything that is really good, that leads to eternal life, we must have the grace of Christ. But the grace of Christ doesn't take away our freedom. It gives us real freedom. And it's that freedom that St. Paul is talking about. The freedom that comes with the Spirit to desire to serve God because we love Him and the power to do it. And we can grow in that. This is the empowerment of the Christian to live by the law. Some people think of freedom as freedom from any kind of moral standards freedom to do what they want. That isn't the freedom that St. Paul talks about. The freedom St. Paul is talking about is the inner freedom. In another passage, he speaks of 
the two laws, the law of the mind and the law of the members of the body. Now, he doesn't there intend to be a dualist and set our soul against the body. What he means to say is that our mind tells us that something is good, but we don't do it. Our feelings, our passions, our appetites, our pride turn us away from what our mind tells us is right. And that constant internal conflict between the mind which sees what is good and really would like to do what is good because we see it's the right thing to do and yet we don't do it. That internal conflict is what Christ has freed us from. The Spirit is able to change us, to transform us, not remotely in heaven, but right here and now, to transform us so that we begin to desire what is good. And the law of our sinfulness is changed into the law of the Spirit. We are transformed by the grace of Christ. I think that's hard to believe it really is hard to believe in our daily life that we can ever come up to the standard set by Jesus Christ, the law as he interprets it. Remember that the Sermon on the Mount begins by Jesus saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, you know, we live in a consumerist society. The world is a kind of a supermarket. You go in and there are all these attractive things. And we would like to have all of them. Give me the whole thing. How then can we ever become poor in spirit? Meaning, become people who see the difference between all of this attractive trash and the things that really count. It's not easy. I assure you that every time I go into a supermarket, I would like it all. It's not easy. And yet, Christ has promised us that he will transform us. And I think that really every serious Christian has experienced that. We know we're not perfect. Far from it. But we knew, do know that the Spirit of God prompts us and that again and again in our life we begin to turn toward the good. We know that God draws us on, that we are being changed by the grace of Christ, that we are being sanctified if we keep seriously at the Christian life. The Catholic especially experiences this in the sacraments. We certainly experience it in reading the scriptures. When we attend the liturgy and hear the Bible read, we find the Holy Spirit struggling in our heart. And we find a transformation going on. But that is brought home especially in the sacraments. You know, Vatican II, in revising the form of the sacraments, the ceremonies of the sacraments, followed one particular principle that's often not noticed and even neglected sometimes. And that is, it tried to bring out that in the performance of every sacrament, there should first be a reading from the scriptures. Even in the sacrament of penance, the liturgical prescriptions of the church require that the person, if possible, and we can't always do this for practical reasons, but if possible, begin, before they make their confession, they read a passage of Scripture 
that inspires them to make a good confession. That's part of the full ceremony of the sacrament of reconciliation. And that's true of all the other sacraments. They begin with scripture readings when they are properly performed. The reason for that is that the scriptures, that the sacraments must be acts of faith. And therefore, they need to be stirred up by the word of God. Our faith is inspired by the word of God and responds to it. It is a living word. But the Catholic who then goes on to receive the sacrament finds a deep experience of transformation if they're serious in receiving the sacraments. For example, when we go to confession, having heard the word of God, which tells us that we are sinners and we need to repent, but God is merciful, when we receive the absolution of the priest, we experience more or less deeply according to our faith and our dispositions at the time, a sense of true forgiveness. We know that God has indeed forgiven us. And we know he's a loving God. And we want to serve him because he is a loving God. We don't want to follow the law merely out of fear. We no longer want to follow the law merely because we might be punished if we don't. We want to follow it because we love the God of mercy who loves us. And the same thing is true, and perhaps in the greatest way of all, in the devout Catholic who receives Holy Communion devoutly. When we go to Mass, we hear the scriptures. We hear the scriptures interpreted by the preacher who speaks in the name of the church and tells us the tradition of the church, how this scripture is to be understood. We take part in the sacrifice, offering ourselves with Christ in the sacrifice. And then we receive him in our body, our hearts, our souls. And when we do that, we find our heart transformed. We find that we are not quite the same kind of person that we were before because we have moved nearer to God. We want more earnestly to do His will. And we have confidence that we can do His will better than we have before. So I want to emphasize that we do experience in our life a transformation. There are days we wonder. There are days I'm 80 years old and I wonder sometimes, I've been at it 80, for 80 years, am I any different than I was 40, 20 years ago? And yet I know God has transformed me. The very fact that I realize my defects and understand them better means that I'm a little bit holier, and you are too. And so the law of Christ is a transforming, life-giving law. It's not a law merely of restriction, imposition, do-nots. It's a law of empowerment. And it makes us like Christ. It makes us like his mother. I think it's important for us to remember her because she, in her, are manifest qualities as are in our, our own mothers that cannot be so easily manifested by a man. Jesus had all these qualities, but because he was a man, he can't show quite the tenderness that a woman can. And so we need to look at Mary and Jesus. It's not an accident that God created us man and woman. He created man and woman that they might complement each other and each manifest God 
in a special way. And so we should look to Jesus and Mary not only as our models, but those who empower us to live as they did. We must live in holiness. Christian morality is a spirituality. It's not just a set of rules. It is a spirituality. It is life in the spirit. It is life that grows and increases. It's a life that travels toward God. 